So, do you see the, 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 the slide, please? Yes. Okay, so we are going to see some distribution on and discussion on Plotozoa. And as I said previously, when we were talking about a medical important parasite classification, we mentioned that uh, we have at least a nematodes, where we have intestinal and tissue nematodes, we have cestodes, we have trematodes, and also we have protozoa. So protozoa, in the protozoa we have this category, also we have four. We have what we call amoeba. Amoeba, they are also called sarcodina. We have flagellates, we have ciliate, and we have sporozoa or apicomplexa. Those uh, protozoa were categorized or classified according to their appendages or their locomotive appendages or their movement uh, ability. Like uh, amoeba or sarcodina, they move by pseudopodia. Pseudopodia, they are the movement, uh, they are the way of the amoeba move. Flagellate, they have flagella that help them to move. Ciliate, they have cilia, while sporozoa or apicomplexa, they don't have appendages for movement. Their mode of transmission, life cycle, pathophysiology, lab diagnosis, treatment, and prevention, we shall see them right now. So we are going to start from intestinal and erogenital protozoa. So it means that there are some protozoa that affect intestinal tract. Okay? Yes. They don't move because they don't have appendages for movement. But they are they can they can go to different body part by also different means. It's like it's like white blood cells. White blood cells in normal they don't have appendages, they don't move but they can move from one site to another. So that's way of movement. It can be facilitated by other, other mechanism, but not appendages. They can be taken by macrophages, by blood circulation, by lymphatic circulation, and so on. So let's start from uh, intestinal and erogenital protozoa. Intestinal and uh, laminal protozoa significant to human health include antamoeba. Antamoeba historitica is the most pathogenic amoeba. Malantidium coli also is somehow pathogenic, but not serious pathogen. pathogen. Jardia lamblia and trichomonas vaginalis, they are flagellate. Jardia can cause diarrhea, as antamoeba and barantidium also jardia cause diarrhea. Trichomonas vaginalis, it's a sexually transmitted disease that uh, colonizes uh, the, the, the vagina. They are flagellate. We have also Cryptosporidium pavum and Isospora belli, which are apicomplexan or sprozoa. They don't have movement appendages, and they cause diarrhea, especially in HIV patients or immunocompromised individuals. Starting from amoeba, amoeba cause what we call amoebiasis.
So, amebiasis is a disease caused by Anthamoeba historitica, and we can have what we call amoebic dysentery and amoebic hepatitis. So it means that anthamoeba can affect gastrointestinal tracts, but also anthamoeba can perforate the intestine and go to affect the liver, cause amoebic hepatitis. So anthamoeba is the major cause of amoebic dysentery. When I say dysentery, there is also another disease called, called bacillary dysentery. Yobita machinya mchinya rguanda. Bacillary dysentery and amoebic dysentery, almost they are the same. They, the clinical presentation is the same. You will find the patient have a bloody diarrhea, very, very diarrheic. And also the patient <coughs> uh, may exhibit uh, anorexia, vomiting, and some other complications. And this is the same for all amoebic or bacillary dysentery, except that one is caused by anthamoeba historitica, while the other is caused by uh, bacteria called the Shigella. So, 0.5 to 50% of the population worldwide harbors this anthamoeba historitica parasite with the higher rate of infection being in underdeveloped countries. Due to poor sanitation and facilities, we have those kind of problems. So, infection is associated with poor hygiene. Humans are the principal host, although dogs, cat, and rodent may also be affected by these parasites. The trophozoites, this parasite has two morphology. One is a trophozoite and an, another one is a cyst. This form has an amoeboid appearance and is usually 15 micrometer in diameter. But the invasive strain tend to be larger than this. On the trichrome stain, you can see the, the, the trophozoite. Those are the trophozoite, how they look like after staining with trichrome stain. Also, this is a trophozoite or vegetative form. But I think I will show you the, 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 the vegetative form with a movement. That is moving with pseudopodia. Pseudopodia, they are also known as the false, false feet. Antamoeba historitica cysts are spherical with refractile wall. The cytoplasm contains dark staining chromatoid bodies. Four nuclei with a central karyosome and evenly distributed peripheral chromatin. So, this antamoeba historitica cyst, remember, in a previous study, we have seen some parasites that may So you are muting. You are muting me. Why? <coughs> Who is muting my microphone? So this is Antamoeba historitica. They are the trophozoites. And this is the cyst which have uh, the, the nuclei. And we have seen that historitica can have one, two, four nuclei. The life cycle is simple. Infection occurs by ingestion of cyst on fecally contaminated food or heart. It means that this is a fecal oral transmission transmitted disease. 
The CST is resistant to gastric juice. It means in our stomach, the cyst can survive and pass into small intestine where it will desist. The metacyst divide into four and then eight amoeba, which move to the large intestine. Majority of organisms are passed out of the body with the feces, but with larger borers of infection, some amoeba attach to and invade mucosal tissues, forming flask-shaped lesions. Then the organism insists to form mitosis and are passed through feces. There is no intermediate or a reservoir to this parasite. It's like this. It's a direct life cycle because it involves only one host. We have here a cyst which is mature. Then the cyst will be ingested by the human and the cyst will resist to gastric acid or gastric juice and will go to small intestine and it will exist or desist and the, the, there will be mitosis to make many trophozoites, amoeba. Then this amoeba we remove to the large intestine, and in the large intestine here, they can become invasive. Invasive means they can perforate. When they are within the gut here, they can they are non-invasive, and they can cause intestinal diseases. But when they perforate, they become invasive and cause extra intestinal diseases such as a uh, hepatitis, amoebic hepatitis. They go to the liver, they can go to the lung, and also they can move to the brain. So when they are here, they cause extra intestinal amoebiasis. And in most of these cases, sometimes it's so dangerous and they can cause death because they are misdiagnosed by routine stool analysis. Because we diagnose this by stool microscopic examination, when they are in the lung, in the liver, in brain, the test of stool analysis is negative. So mostly they fa we fail, we can treat with antibiotic thinking that this is another disease, but you, you they, they resist to antibiotic. It's a wrong treatment. So finally, it can cause death to the patient because it has been missed or misdiagnosed. Infection by antamoeba is occurs by ingestion of mature cysts in fecally contaminated food, water, or hands. Ex excitations occurs in small intestine and the trophozoites are released and they migrate to large intestine. The trophozoites multiply by binary fission and produce cysts, which are passed in the feces. Because of the protection comforted by their wall, the cyst can survive days to weeks in the external environment and are responsible for transmission. So trophozoites can also be passed in diarrhea stool but are rapidly destroyed once outside the body, and if ingested, they would not survive exposure to gastric environment. So the infective stage is the cyst. In many cases, the trophozoite remain confined to the intestinal lumen. That's the non-invasive form of antamoeba of individuals who are thus as the carrier and cyst passes. It means that he can keep passing cyst, contaminating other individuals but don't have diarrhea and so on. In some patients now, the trophozoite will invade intestinal mucosa and cause intestinal disease. Or through the bloodstream, 
extraintestinal sites such as the liver, brain, lung, which will result in extraintestinal disease. It has been established that invasive and non-invasive form represent separate species. Sometime, antamoeba historitica and antamoeba dispa, which are morphologically indistinguishable, can contribute in this. Antamoeba dispa, which is not known to be very pathogenic. Transmission can occur through fecal exposure during sexual contact, in which case not only resist but also trophozoite could prove infective. So, uh, how is the symptom of this amoebiasis? You can have frequent dysentery with necrotic mucosa and abdominal pain. Ukuvanga umuntu agira diare irimo mucus. Miko mucoid bloody diarrhea. Recurrent episode of dysentery with blood and mucus in the feces. They are intervening gastrointestinal disturbances and sometimes constipation. Cysts are found in the stool. Organism may invade the liver, lung, brain, where it produces abscess that result in liver dysfunction, pneumonitis, and encephalitis. And those complications can progress to death. Intestinal ureters are due to enzymatic degradation of the tissue produced by antamoeba historitica, and infection may result in appendicitis, perforation, liver abscess, sometimes brain abscess, lung and spleen abscess, and so on. So we diagnose this by symptoms, history, and epidemiology of the. Yes. Appendicitis, last time I told you the meaning of itis. Itis, itis means inflammation. So appendicitis is inflammation of the appendix. So in the laboratory, the infection is confirmed by finding cysts in the stool. Also, the trophozoite in the stool. Antamoeba historitica infection is distinguished from bacillary dysentery by lack of high fever and the absence of leukocytosis. It means that if you are a doctor in a clinic, you are treating this kind of infection, and you are confused whether it's a bacillary dysentery or uh, antamoeba historitica dysentery, or amoebic dysentery, you will check for white blood cell count. If they are normal, it's not a bacillary dysentery, it's amoebic. And also, if the patient has a fever, certainly it's bacillary dysentery. But antamoeba historitica, you normally don't have fever, you don't have that kind of leukocytosis. But still, you can have bloody diarrhea or mucoid diarrhea and abdominal pain as well as vomiting. So this is diagnosis of intestinal amoebiasis and hepatic amoebiasis, where some tests are positive, like a stool sample is positive in a uh, intestinal, but when it goes to the liver, stool is negative. I have already said that. So sometimes when it's extra-intestinal, it's difficult to diagnose. That's why it's difficult and very dangerous and cause even a death. Distinction must be made from other non-pathogenic and, and intestinal protozoa such as Antamoeba coli, Although we say that 
this antimyeba cola is not pathogenic, but depending on immunity, this become pathogenic and when it is found in a patient with a clinical presentation, the patient needs to be treated. However, it's also difficult for technician to distinguish antimyeba coli and the historitica sometime, but when uh, the stool sample is bloody and mucoid, certainly it's antimyeba historitica. Coli do not cause bloody or mucoid diarrhea. It can cause just diarrhea or abdominal discomfort, but not bloody diarrhea. Antamoeba aritimani, dientamoeba flagellis and onimaxinana, iodamoeba buschi, all of those can also be found in intestine, but they are not really pathogenic. This is antamoeba coli, trophozoid. This is the cyst of coli, and antamoeba coli have a bigger size compared to historitica with many nucleus. If you look in this, this cyst, look, try to look here. We have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inside the, the cyst, there are eight nucleus. But for historitica, we have at least one to four nucleus. Those are Antamoeba artimani and Orimaxinana. This is how a clinician can distinguish amoebic dysentery by bacillary dysentery. There is just a simple, a simple test that you can ask. pH, pH, pH of the stool. When pH is acidic and the patient has clinical presentation, has a bloody diarrhea, mostly it's amoebic dysentery. But when pH is alkaline, and the patient also have that kind of clinical presentation, including abdominal discomfort, vomiting, bloody diarrhea. This is exactly bacillary dysentery. So the pH is a simple tool that help you to identify those kind of infection. Then afterward, after knowing the pH, you can now progress to final identification either by culture of bacillary of the, the, the bacteria, if it's a bacillal or identification or microscope, if it's amoebic dysentery. The other are complementary, but this pH is very simple to do, very cheap, very fast, and they can give you a, a, a presumptive diagnosis. So if you have that confusion, you can request that kind of exam. This is the morphology of the cyst, Antamoeba historitica, vegetative form, this is the cyst. This is the cyst, this is a vegetative form. And cyst can have around zero to four nuclei compared to Antamoeba coli. This is Antamoeba historitica. We treat this by metronidazole. It's used for symptomatic and chronic amoebiasis, including extra intestinal diseases. However, many people complain that they have been infected. They took treatment, but they don't get well, or they don't cure. The problem of this is not the drug itself. The problem is associated to continuous exposure or continued infection. If you are still living in a condition that exposes you to the infection, even if you take treatment, tomorrow you will get infected again and the disease will come again. So people in the village, they say, you know what, I have been diagnosed of having uh, antamoeba historitica or amoebiasis. I took metronidazole, but I didn't get well. 
maybe I get well a moment, then let alone I get sick again. It means that you get treatment, you get well, and you get infected again. That's what happened. So you should get treatment, but also change lifestyle. If you are drinking an, uh, the, 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 if you are drinking bad water, if you are not used the hand, hand washing before eating or after toilet, if your lifestyle is still like that, if you live in a village where the toilet is not covered, how the fleas are coming and uh, uh, fall down on the plate, then you go to eat with those. That kind of habit will expose you to the subsequent infection because you treat, you kill the parasite in your body with metronidazole, but um, your surrounding environment is also uh, a source of contamination. And maybe you are living with some carriers, so you will keep getting infected and you will not cure as you should. I can show you one kind of antamoeba. Lecture. Yes. Lecture. Can uh, amoeba histolytica lead to death? Yes, it can. It if it if it goes to the to the liver and cause hepatitis, if it goes to the lung, to the brain, yes, prognosis is not good. But it's a good guy that responded to metronidazole treatment once it treated well on time. So the outcome will depend whether it's intestinal. I want to show you guys this kind of antamoeba. This is a stool sample that was analyzed. And you can see how the amoeba, in fact, it doesn't have exactly the, the appendages, just it moves with this uh, pseudopodia. It will it elongate the body and again, and again, and again, and again. This is how Antamoeba historica look like on a microscope. But this should be done, the stool should be examined, or the stool should be examined immediately after elimination. If you take your stool sample and you send it to the lab maybe in one hour, they will not find those parasites because they are very fragile and they die. They will say report negative. But if you report immediately, you give the sample immediately after stool elimination, they put on microscope, you will find this kind of antamoeba historica. This is how it looks like. Okay? Did you see it? Yes. Okay, now let's talk, take another one. Giardia, that the causative agent of giardiasis or lambriasis. Jaridia lamblia, it's a fragilate and it has a worldwide distribution. Jaridia, also which has both trophozoid and uh, cyst form, similarly to Antamoeba historitica, it can measure the trophozoid can measure around 
15 micrometer it's like two red blood cells it's a half pear shaped organism with eight flagella this one moves by flagella and it has two axostyles arranged in bilateral symmetry there are two anteriorly located the large suction disc sucking disc or suction discs the cytoplasm contains two nuclei that uh, when you look them it's like they are eyes and two parabasal bodies while the cyst is smaller it's nine micrometer it's an ellipsoid cell it has a shape like a chicken egg with a smooth, well-defined wall. Cytoplasm contains four nuclei and many of the stru structures seen in the trophozoids. This is the, 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 the Jardia lamblia stained by hematoxylin and eosin. This is the Jardia lamblia in the stool sample. This is it. Okay, this is the, the diagram, a drawing, but this is this is the real morphology in stool sample. This is a jardia in a stool. This is a, tro a, 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 a cyst and this is a trophozoid. So we have these two sucking discs, which it used to suck nutrient and to touch to the mucosa. When you look at it, they are like big eyes. And on it, we have uh, this. It is an exostyle. Exostyle. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, flagella. We have two anterior. And also we have the remaining posterior, posterior flagella. This is how it looks like in a microscope. This is the cyst, this is the trophozoite. So infection of Fujaridia lambria occurs by ingestion of the cyst, usually in a contaminated water. This cessation occurs in the duodenum and the trophozoites colonize the upper small intestine where they may swim freely or attach to the submucosal epithelium. Free trophozoite will insist again as they move down the stream and the mitosis takes place during their insistment. The cyst then are passed in the stool whereby man is the primary host, but pigs and monkeys also can be infected and serve as a reservoir or source of another infection to human. This is the life cycle. It's simple, it's a direct life cycle. You get infected by ingestion of the cyst. If you ingest the trophozoid, Maybe you the trophozoite will be destroyed by gastric juice and it will not resist there. So it will not cause infection. And the parasite live in the duodenum. Question. Yes. Question reaction. Yes, go ahead. Uh, what's the difference between cyst and trophozoite? Okay. The cyst simply, I can say that a, a trophozoite is an active form of the parasite, active form, but the cyst is an inactive form. It means that. 
you are seeing that here the cyst the cyst don't have movement appendages it can it can't move but trophozoite it, it's like uh, it's like it's active and it have those trophozoite the, the, those flagella that help in movement so cyst also it's a protective form of this parasite when the condition are not favorable for the parasite the parasite will make cyst so that it will resist to those condition but once the condition become favorable the cyst will again germinate and become a trophozoite that is how it occurs it occurs so for the for the helminth for helminth we yeah we are used to talk about eggs egg of schistosoma egg of uh, ascaris egg of trichiris but for protozoa we don't say eggs we say cyst and we will see then later in apicomplexa we have we don't say cyst we say oocyst we will see it later but you have to keep in your mind that we don't say eggs for protozoa so we can say cyst as an inactive form as a protective form for the parasite while trophozoite is an inactive form and mostly when you have cyst you don't have clinical presentation because they are not invasive you may not have clinical presentation but you are a carrier or a cyst passer you can pass cyst in the stool then the cyst will infect your friend your colleague your environment and subsequently cause infection but when there are uh, trophozoites you are sick exactly the cyst are resistant forms and are responsible for transmission of gyrbiasis <coughs> Of a cyst. Uh. Okay, can you say that that trophozoite is like relevant in the parasite? But trophozoite is not a lava. They are trophozoite. Don't try to 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 to, to bring other name. They are trophozoite. They are not. They are not. They are not lava, but they are active form of the parasite, as the lava are active form of the parasite. Okay, take as as you want, but they are not lava. Okay, they are trophozoites. They are also we call them vegetative form or active form of the parasite. Question. Mm. How do trophozoids turn to cyst? Like what makes it turn to cyst? They are different factors, but in general, the trophozoite to become a cyst, the, the environmental condition are not favorable of the parasite. It's like it is hiding. Hmm? It is hiding. When the conditions are not good, it seems the trophozoite will say, oh, if I don't change my position, uh, maybe I will not survive in this environment. Now let's try to enter into my protective form. So in that way, it will shut down all metabolic activities because the trophozoite undergoes some metabolic activities. It absorbs the nutrient from the, the host. While the cyst doesn't absorb nutrient, it's there just waiting for variable condition to germinate and become a trophozoite again. So shh, there will be shutdown of metabolic activities and so on. Then and cyst make a cyst. Yes. Mm. 
Say you what? Yes. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yes. To, to to answer to answer you to your question, uh, let's say that even in the outside the environment, the deceased cannot desist cannot germinate because the outside of the body, the environmental condition like sun, like humidity, like temperature and so on, are not favorable. But once they are in their, uh, their home, let's say once they are at their home, once they are in, in their tropical area, we call it a tropism, the area where the parasites feel like comfortable. At that site, they are stimulated by different factors. They can sense the situation and recognize that the, the conditions are favorable. Then they will germinate. Once they are in the stomach, they can't germinate. Once they are in the other body part, they can't germinate. But when they are in the duodenum, they, that's where they are not affected by different, different substances. And we have seen that when they pass down in the, the large intestine, they again assist. If a trophozoite is in the duodenum and they go down to the, to the, large intestine, it will again assist. So uh, we can try to find much more the factors that contribute to, to the parasite to feel more comfortable in the duodenum compared to the other, other, other body part. But each parasite, each microorganism has a tropism. A tropism means that it has a specific body site where it will live, reproduce, and even cause disease. That's how like hepatitis virus will find them in the liver. That's how a So, am I clear? So, the cysts are resistant form and are responsible for transmission of giardiasis. Both cysts and the trophozoites can be found in the feces. They are diagnostic stages of giardiasis. Cysts are hard can survive several months in the environment, and infection occurs by ingestion of cysts in contaminated water, food, or by the fecal oral route, like hand and deformities or materials. In the small intestine, then, excitation will release trophozoid, and each cyst can produce around two active trophozoids. Trophozoids, will multiply by longitudinal binary fusion remaining in the lumen of the proximal small bowl where they can be free or even attached to the mucosa by ventral sucking disc. You have seen the sucking disc, those big things that look like eyes. So, ancestation occurs as the parasite transit toward the colon meaning that in the colon, the conditions are not favorable. The cyst is the stage found most commonly in non diarrheal feces. It means that this guy is a carrier of the parasite. 
because the cysts are infectious when passed in the stool or shortly afterward, a person-to-person -person transmission is possible while animals are infected with Fujardia. The importance as a reservoir is not very well characterized, but it's possible. So you can have like symptoms, uh, the, 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 the same like the previous one of Antamoeba historitica, but here, uh, it's not common to have a bloody diarrhea. You can have just a diarrhea, mucoid diarrhea, but not really a diarrhea, the, the bloody diarrhea, because giardia it's less invasive. It can't perforate intestine. And the more chronic stage is associated with vitamin B deficiency, Malabsorption due to the B12 malabsorption, disaccharide deficiency and lactose intolerance, and this is due to poor absorption or poor digestion of the lipid uh, component from the food. So, covering of the intestinal epithelium by the trophozoite and uh, flattening of the mucosal surface there will be a malabsorption of the nutrient, how this will cause uh, my nutrition and even B12 deficiency, which will result into anemia. And also you can face lipid deficiency as the food you are taking containing the lipid will be eliminated as they are. There is some role of immunoglobulin class A and M, IgA and IgM, and there is increased incidence of infection in immunodeficient patients, HIV. I, 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 I remember a case of HIV patient who was diagnosed of having this giardia, and the later on progressed to severe case. She, had, she was a lady and she had a very serious diarrhea. Although treatment was given, but diarrhea didn't stop and she passed away. So uh, depending on immunity, the infection can be serious and prognosis may be different depending on your immunity. So diagnosis, it's about a history symptoms of the patient including abdominal pain diarrhea vomiting also we look at epidemiology of the disease if we are in endemic area we have to suspect it but as the intestinal parasite may have same or similar clinical presentation we need to have a laboratory diagnosis whereby stool sample is taken and analyzed on microscopy and those typical morphology should be seen on under microscopy, including the cyst and also the trophozoite. Treatment also is similar to the previous parasite. Metronidazole is the drug of choice and is effective. So as I told you guys, the most problem that we have, it's not a resistant to the drug, but it's that we are still living in a, in a, we are still living closer to, to the source of infection. If you are in a village, you get infected, you get sick, you take treatment, but you keep living in the same condition. Lifestyle don't change. You keep drinking and boil the water. You keep having, uh, in not washing hand and so on. So those factors that contribute in transmission of the disease will also cause another infection and you will get sick again and complaining that drug is not effective. But again, the the carriers, if they are carriers, they are they will keep spreading infection and subsequently you get infected and get sick again. 
there is no specific immunity to these parasites because if uh, it's like a bacterial infection or viral infection, once you get infected, the immunity will remain what we call memory, memory that will recognize a future infection and contribute in protection. But for these parasites, there is no memory, there is no future protection once you get reinfected. When you get reinfected, you get sick again. So uh, let's see if I can find a Jardia. How it looks like. Let's see this one if it can. Probably it's not well seen, but you look at this, this one. On microscopy, everything that you are seeing, they are not of importance. If you see those small things, those small things, they are bacteria, those are bacteria and those are the normal flora from the gut. You know that I'm saying that uh, a human being has normal flora in the gut. So when a stool sample is being analyzed, always you see many things. So you have to know and to differentiate those things that you are seeing. Otherwise you can say all of these moving things, they are parasites or microorganisms. No, they are not. Those are bacteria. They are normal flora or fecal normal flora because also they are important in to our body. If we don't have normal flora, it's a serious problem. So you have to know the morphology. This is like, like this, this is a cyst. This is a cyst of Jaredia lambria on microscopy. This is how it looks like. So for more, you can even go to find a video and have a look on your own. This is the trophozoites, and those moving things, they are bacteria. Those bacteria, they are gut microbiota. So we do not uh, pay attention on them. Okay, so I think that's all. Now let's go to uh, another parasite, Balantidium coli and Cryptosporidium. Balantidium coli is a ciliate and it's not really common pathogen. It can even be found in the environment. But as I said, immunity contributes to seriousness or prognosis of the, the disease. If you are immunocompromised, Balantidium coli can cause diarrhea. The same for Cryptosporidium pavum that cause diarrhea in uh, HIV patients. Both are zoonotic protozoa. It means that they can come from animal to human being and they cause intestinal infection with some health significance. There is also another one called Isospola belli, which is an opportunistic human parasite. Is uh, uh, opportunistic means that it 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 depends on immunosuppression. If you are immunosuppressed, you can get infected and infection becomes serious as well. So, Balantidium coli is a parasite primary of cow, 
of pigs, of horse, and it's bigger. It can measure around 100 micrometer. It is a ciliate. It moves by the cilia that is around of all around the, 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 the cell wall or the surface or the cell membrane. Infection occurs mostly in the farm workers and the other rural areas whereby cysts are ingested in the fecal material of the farm animals. So those persons who are working in the farm, they can easily get infected by this Barantidium coli. And if their immunity is not strong, they can develop diarrhea. Sometimes the cowboys, they drink water, the same water as the water the cow drink in the stream or in the liver and so on. So in that way, the cow contaminates the water, then the man consumes the, 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 the water, then get transmitted. Symptoms and the pathogenesis of balantidiasis are similar to those seen in previously, like antamo uh, antamoeba historitica, including intestinal epithelial erosion. However, liver, lung, brain abscess are not seen due to this parasite is not invasive. It can't perforate intestine. It just stops in the, the intestine. Met metconidazole and the I do quinolon. Quinol is the, the drug that can add the drug that can be used to to treat infection. And mostly balantidium is not known to cause a serious infection unless, uh, unless you are immunocompromised, as I said. So that's the morphology. This is the parasite. Those are the cili, cili that are all around the cell, cell surface. This is the trophozoite. This is how it looks like. And also they have a very rapid movement. If I try to show you here. Antidium coli. It has a very fast movement under microscopy. And it's very simple to recognize as it has, it's bigger than Antamoeba historitica and when it moves, you can easily see those, those cilia. Do you see it? This one. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah, so this is the parasite.
So, uh, are we still together? Yes. Okay. So this is the the Barantidium coli trophozoite on microscope. Life cycle, I told you, it's a fecal oral transmission. The sister, the parasite stage, responsible for transmission of Barantidiasis. Host most often acquire the cyst through ingestion of contaminated food or water. Following ingestion, excitation occurs in the small intestine and the trophozoite colonizes large intestine. The trophozoite resides in the lumen of the large intestine of human and animals, where they replicate by binary fusion during which conjugation may occur. So trophozoite undergo ancestation to produce infective cysts. Some trophozoite invade the wall for the colon and multiply. Some return the lumen and disintegrate. Mature cysts pass within feces. That's all. Treatment, I told you, it's the same. We use metronidazole and is effective. Let's now talk another... Um, opportunistic protozoa, it's Clibutosporidium pavum. This is very common in HIV patient. When you take HIV patient stool sample, most probably you will find this parasite. But when their immunity is weak, they can develop diarrhea. So it's the common causative of diarrhea in HIV patient. So Cribotosporidium pavum is a small round parasite measuring 5 micrometer, very small compared to red blood cell. It is found in the gastrointestinal tract of many animals and causes epidemics of diarrhea in human via contaminated food and water. Humans are infected by ingestion of Cryptosporidium pavum oocysts containing many sporozoids. Guys, don't get confused as previously. On Antamoeba Historitica, we used it to say cyst. Now, for apicomplexan, because Cryptosporidium is an apicomplexan, we don't say cyst, we say oocyst. So the trophozoite are released in the upper GI tract and attached to the gut mucosal cell where they divide to produce merozoites. So we have sporozoite, we have merozoite. The merozoite will invade other mucosal cell and further multiply asexually. Those are the oocysts of Cryptosporidium pavum in a wet mount seen with differential interface contrast. Also, this is uh, the oocyst of Cryptosporidium pavum stained by acid fast stain. Acid fast stain, it's a diagnostic. Acid fast stain, it's a diagnostic stage or a diagnostic procedure. So we can't easily look and observe those uh, cysts under microscope without performing this acid fast stain. The same method as TB diagnostic procedures. So this is on fluorescent microscope by oramine stain. Here this is uh, by as the first stain, previously they called it modified quinone, but we call it acid the first stain. Then this is Cryptosporidium pavum on wet mount without staining. Those are the, the oocyst. This is acid the first stain, the common used method for diagnosis. And those are oocyst on fluorescent microscope. And here it's uh, unstained, unstained microscope. 
Some of the merozoids differentiate into male and female gametes and formosis in which they multiply and differentiate into spermatozoids. So, some of the merozoites differentiate into male and female gametes and form oocysts, in which they multiply and differentiate into sporozoids. The mature oocyst is excreted with fecal material and infect other individuals. When the large number of human in a community have diarrhea, the most likely cause is cryptosporidium pavum. Small bolus of infection may cause mild diarrhea, while larger intake of organism may cause more pronounced or serious symptoms, including copious water diarrhea. Are you following or disturbing? Because there are so many noises that coming from you guys. So You can have this kind of uh, copy. So extra. You're muted. You're muted, extra. I don't hear you. Actually, I don't hear you. So, in HIV patient, organism may cause prolonged severe diarrhea, and the organism may invade the gallbladder, biliary tract, and the lung epithelium. There is no approved effective treatment for cryptosporidiasis. Although paromycin is used as an investigational drug, there are a variety of antibody tests for detection, but many of these detection uh, many of these detect other species of cryptosporidium than cryptosporidium pavum. Sensitive polymerase chain reaction tests like PCR are available for cryptosporidium pavum detection in environmental and animal samples. This is the life cycle. It's a simple life cycle whereby sporulated oocysts containing phosphorozoids are excreted by the infected host through feces and possibly other routes such as respiratory, respiratory secretion. Transmission of cryptosporidium pavum occurs mainly through contact with contaminated water, drinking or recreation water. Occasionally, food sources such as kitchen salad may serve as a vehicle for transmission. Many outbreaks in the U.S. have occurred in the water park, community swimming pool and daycare centers. 
Zoonotic transmission of Cryptosporidium pavum occurs through exposure to infected animal or exposure to water contaminated by feces of infected animals, following ingestion and possibly inhalation by suitable host. Existation can occur disprosoid at least than um, parasite parasitize epithelial cells. Yes. You don't see my slide, but it's shared. Yeah. Hmm? You don't see it. Thank you. Don't you want to go Yeah, it's okay right now. Zoonotic transmission of Cryptosporidium pavum occurs through exposure to infected animal or exposure to water contaminated by feces or infected animals. Following ingestion and possibly narration, existation will occur, the sporozoid will be released and parasite parasitize the epithelium of gastrointestinal tract or other tissues such as respiratory tract if they are inhaled. In these cells, the parasite will undergo a sexual multiplication called a, known as chizogony or merogony, and then sexual multiplication called the gamogony, producing my, macrogamont, male and macrogamont, female, micro and macro. Upon fertilization of macrogamont by the microgametes, the oocyst will develop that sporulate in the infected host. Two different types of oocyst are produced. The thick world, which is commonly excreted from the host, and the thin world, which is primarily involved in auto infection. So the oocysts are infective upon excretion, permitting direct and immediate fecal oral transmission. Oocyst of Cyclospora chitinensis, this is another sporozoid, are an at the time of excretion and they don't become infective until sporulated in environment. We have also another one called Isospora belli. Isospora belli is a rare infection of
Isospolabelli. Isospolabelli is a rare infection of, of normal human, but as I said previously, it can be found in immunocompromised person or person with immunosuppression. Infection occurs via orofecal root. Infective stage of organism is a novel oocyst, which upon ingestion follow the same way as Cryptosporidium. The disease produces symptoms similar to those of Giardiasis, diarrhea. In normal individuals, mild infection resolve themselves with rest and mild diet and heavier infection need treatment. So, the treatment may have to be carried on for prolonged period in HC patients. This is the morphology of OCIST, Isospola belli. Maybe let's move, let's remove the, 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 the camera. Otherwise, my slide. Should be seen. So this is Isospola belli on wet mount. It's like this. It has an egg, like a chicken egg or a cyst of giardia, but inside you can see two nuclei and very, very big nuclei that are easily seen. Or you can even not see this one, but you see very big nuclei, uh, central nuclei that can easily be seen. So, at the time of excretion, the immature oocyst contain unusual one sporoblast more rare too. In further maturation, after excretion, the sporoblast will divide into two. The oocyst now contain two sporoblasts. This one, here we have two, but here it's one. Then, the sporoblast secrete a cyst or thus becoming sporocyst, and the sporocyst will divide it twice produce for sporozoids each. Infection occurs by ingestion of sporocysts containing oocysts. The sporocysts exist in the small intestine and release their sporozoids, which invade the epithelium and initiate the chrysogony. So when you are doing your assignment, you will pass through this and try to understand life cycle and tell me what is the infective stage, what is diagnostic stage, and so on. Upon rupture of the sky zones, the merozoids are released, invade the new epithelial cells, and continue the cycle of asexual reproduction. The trophozoites develop into sky zones, which contain multiple merozoids, whereby a minimum of one week asexual stage will be begun. Fertilization will result in development of oocysts that are excreted yeah. in a stool sample. So this isospola belli infect both human and animals. So I think uh, we can see, we can have a break. We can Hello. have a break. So like, uh, yeah, before yes, break, I have a in what you have seen, lecture we have seen some treatment you can use for for intermoeba, no amoebiosis and another. Yeah, but about metronidazole, I have read that 
uh, many of um, protozoa diseases can uh, mm. resist to that medication, especially if someone take it more many times. Yeah, what mm. another alternative uh, treatment he can use, he or she can use after resistance of those oh. metronidazole. For, for this cryptosporidium, uh, we do not treat as the previous antamoeba historitica and so on. Here we can use antibiotics, antibiotics such as uh, azithromycin has shown an effective efficacy on treating this, but also paromycin. Paromycin, we have seen it previously, also is used or if it's not, you can use a nitazoxanide. Those are different drugs. You can try to find them or you will study them because you will have another cause of infectious disease. When you will be in a doc two, doc two, you will study infectious disease. That's where you will study many treatment of different diseases. So you can treat with antibiotic, you can treat with nitazoxamide, or you can treat with palomomycin. Okay? Thirty minutes, we come at ten thirty exactly. Is it okay? Yeah, but I see a, yes. a very small number of students. You tell them those who didn't attend today to join the class from 10 to 30. Bye.